for uh, joining us for our uh, artist panel. And uh, my name is Marlo Slayback. I am the National Director of Student Programs at ISI, and it's my great pleasure to join these two esteemed artists um, to discuss great artists and uh, the revival of the arts and, of course, the, um, you know, the issues that uh, encounter us every day, whether it comes from to architecture and ugly architecture in particular, to um, to beautiful, <laughs> more ugly than than beautiful. But of course, you're joining us at a beautiful campus today, so um, so that's I think that counts for something. And uh, of course, great poetry and how um, we can create these. Uh, you know, we're talking about titans of industry next. How we can cre create these titans of of the arts, like like we used to see and um, that we continue to rebel today. Um, so. Great art is a sign of civilization. And we've reflected on history's great artists like Leonardo and Michelangelo as dreamers, innovators, and explorers who made such a dramatic impact on the artistic landscape that they ultimately changed how we viewed mankind. When we think Renaissance Florence, it's the extraordinary artistic work in the form of painting, sculpture, architecture, um, and that's what comes to mind first, right? In this way, art can and has served as a barometer of uh, cultural vitality. So where's our Leonardo today? To bring this topic to our shores, and especially to Wyeth country where you're all joining us, um, and we have a Wyeth expert with us today, uh, how do Americans even come to agree on what beauty even means to be able to know what art is worth patronizing or worth building in our capital cities and communities for public enjoyment and pride and the common good? Does beauty even matter for that uh, if we're on that subject? As my friend Alan Cornett, who was actually once Russell Kirk's assistant has said, um, we can't build what they built because we don't believe what they believed. It's not a matter of technical ability. We have the technical ability. We just choose not to use it. So I'm honored to be joined by Dana Joya and Barksdale Maynard, two authorities in the arts and especially in their respective fields of poetry and art history to help us understand what it took to create great art, how the Wyatts, the illustrious local Brandywine artists did it, and what these great artists can teach us today. So I hope that this is a free-flowing conversation with an opportunity towards the end to take your questions. I know a lot of you had questions for Dana earlier during the luncheon, so I'm hoping that um, you brought those to this discussion. I'm going to start by introducing Dana. Dana Joya is an internationally acclaimed poet and writer, former California Poet Laureate and Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. Joya was born in Los Angeles of Italian and Mexican descent. The first person in his family to, to, to attend college, he received a BA and MBA from Stanford and an MA from Harvard in comparative literature. For 15 years, he worked as a businessman before quitting at 41 to become a full-time writer. Thank you for joining us, Dana. Um, next to Dana is Barksdale Maynard, who is author of Artists of Wyeth Country, Howard Pyle, N.C. Wyeth, and Andrew Wyeth, which combines art history and with the detailed exploration of the historic landscapes of Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, not far from ISI headquarters. The book features entirely new and unauthorized biograph biographical accounts of the lives of three great artists, including Andrew Wyeth, plus six walking and driving tours you can take. Maynard has been a lecturer in art and architectural history at Princeton University and John Hopkins University at the University of Delaware and Delaware College of Art and Design. He is the author of eight books and more than 100 articles in 27 magazines and newspapers, including the Washington Post and the New York Times. He's been a studio artist and illustrator since 1998. Please join me in w welcoming our two uh, guests today. So let's start with uh, some opening statements from both of you. And then from there, we'll go on to, I'll, I'll ask some questions. I'll pepper those in there. Um, and we'll have a free flowing uh, conversation where there will be disagreement. Um, but I think that's where the beauty, no pun intended, will be. Um, so we'll start with Dana. I suspect there'll be fewer disagreements than, than you might uh, think. Um, this is a vast topic. Um, it is a topic that's rarely discussed on the right. Uh, and it's uh, a subject which I think is completely confused in current American artistic and intellectual life. I think by and large, uh, many of the major institutions today are operating under uh, what I would think of as, as unrealistic uh, aesthetics and goals. And the result of that is bad art, bad architecture, 
uh, bad writing, bad painting, and bad education. Everybody in the room is the recipient uh, of, of these uh, unwanted gifts. And generally on the right, my sense is that people have pretty good instincts, but very little ability to, uh, to articulate those. And they're often ones that have not been educated. Uh, artistic appetite, artistic knowledge is like any kind of knowledge or any kind of, of thing. You play the piano for two weeks, you play the piano for 20 years. If you're any really good at the end of 20 years, you're going to be better at it. Um, and so, the, so the, imagine as, a, as the audience, your responses will differ in some ways uh, in regard to your personal formation. You know, we form our adult identities, we form our imagination and our intellects. And American public schools uh, have basically uh, let our education drop out of it. American public culture, uh, as represented by our media, has let it out. So people basically, if you haven't learned it in your family or by yourself, you know, you have a kind of haphazard um, uh, formation in this. Uh, but anyone can refine their taste, can expand their knowledge of these things. I was lucky. I was a poor kid in uh, working class LA. My, not only did my parents not go to college, I didn't know a single adult who had gone to college. I knew that the priest had gone to seminary, uh, but it was just not part of our thing. In fact, I didn't know many parents that could speak English without an accent. Uh, but in second grade, Sister Camille Cecile uh, gave me, started giving me piano lessons. And she was the old school. If you missed a note, she hit you. Uh, <laughs> which I have to say for, was the same way that my family uh, felt that education did. And I didn't mind me, at, you know, it, didn't, it didn't bruise me at all. It just got my attention. And within a couple of years, I was playing Bartok. Uh, by the eighth grade, I was playing Chopin sonatas. Uh, she gave a free theory lesson to students who wanted it. Uh, this these lessons cost me $4 a month, uh, which even my family could afford. And I gained from the discipline of piano playing, from the ability to have a teacher who gave me great music to, to produce and to listen to it, it formed my character in the same way that the Latin church did, you know, which I, we, I was uh, pre-Vatican too. So, uh, you know, we would sing the great hymns in Latin written by Thomas Aquinas, the, the mass had a dignity. And in my crummy town, the one place that was really beautiful, well, there was two places, was the theater and the, and the church. And I would go into the church and it told me what the architecture of a church should tell anyone is that things happen in this building that might not happen outside. That there's a, a potential for a kind of enlightenment here. And in this church was the loudest sound or the loudest pleasant sound, because we were in the flight path of LAX, uh, <laughs> the loudest beautiful sound I ever, which was this enormous organ. It wasn't uh, particularly well played, but by God, when the organ went going, it, it gave you the fear of God, uh, you know, in a, in a way. And so. I came, uh, I went through 12 years of Catholic education. I did Latin. My first poets I really read, because we didn't have much literary education, but they didn't want us to become priests. Uh, so they gave us good Latin. So when I came to Stanford uh, with a bad education from poor neighborhood, in some ways I had a better formation than most of the other students. Uh, you know, I could hear language. I could hear the echoes of language. I, you know, I had this deep, uh, musical culture, and I was able to, to build a life as an artist on that, a life which none of the people in my Mexican or Italian fi family would have ever have dared to dream. Uh, even though I spent 15 years in business, I've, I've made a life for myself that would have been inconceivable for my great-grandfather, who was a vaquero, and my grandfather, who started off as a cowboy, uh, and, you know, my the manual laborers in my family. So, uh, for me, my, my life has been largely the life of an artist uh, who was trying to figure a way, the way all artists do, of how the hell you make a living. And I've had to kind of answer a lot of, of aesthetic questions, not from academic knowledge, but by saying, I'm confronted with an intellectual or practical problem as an artist. How do I figure it out? And that's made me essentially ask fundamental artistic questions, which were never asked uh, in my education. What's the purpose of poetry? 
What's the purpose of art? You know, why does nobody talk about beauty anymore? Yet that's kind of what I feel. And, uh, and I also felt as an artist, I wanted to create art that a fellow artist, a knowledgeable person could respond to, but the people I came from could still respond to. And, and I don't think that art necessarily excludes people. Um, you know, I think actually, you know, it's something that should draw people together, which ironically was uh, the original purpose of the National Endowment for the Arts. It was created under a president that nobody would have thought created it, Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon did it because he felt that, that people that disagreed on other things essentially could agree on beauty. And I believe that. I believe that beauty brings us into a realm of human consciousness, of human experience that transcends ideology and affirms our common humanity. It, it affirms our individual and expands and, and uh, refines our individual humanity, but it also makes us understand other people better. So anyway, I could go on forever, and uh, you would probably be so polite that you wouldn't leave for two hours, but I think I'll leave my opening statement there. Thank you, Dana. Now, Berksdale, could you, you know, provide, um, in addition to, to the statements that you have in your you know, mind prepared, uh, for those unfamiliar with the Wyatts, if you can give some background um, about who they are, and obviously they were, they were related to each other, um, perhaps some information about their impact on the greater American artistic landscape, but especially in the Brandywine Valley. Thanks, Marla. We're, we're sitting here in the Brandywine Valley. I hope you've all walked over and looked at the view that you get from ISI. It's spectacular. Brandywine Valley is a very special place. It's art, it's industry combined, merged together. It's this beautiful natural landscape. And we have this extraordinary group of artists here, starting with Howard Pyle, the illustrator, famous for pirate pictures. And Howard Pyle's illustrations of pirates have become the standard Hollywood model of what a pirate is. Um, in fact, it's become very hard to buy Howard Pyle's art because all the Hollywood producers and actors are buying up Howard Pyle because he's a Hollywood icon. And this is in the 1880s, 1890s. And then he brings in these young students in kind of an ISI-like setting, and he teaches them art up the Brandywine Valley on the Brandywine battlefield. This is the site of the largest land battle of the Revolutionary War. Howard Pyle really wants his students to understand American history, especially the Revolution. Frankly, a lot of illustration work around 1900 was pictures of battles, Civil War battles, Revolutionary battles, and his, his star student from Massachusetts is N.C. Wyeth. And N.C. Wyeth goes on to become, I think, the greatest ever American illustrator, an extraordinary talent, a fascinating person. N.C. Wyeth, very responsive to the Brandywine Valley. He loves our history that goes back you know, 300 years of, of European settlement in this valley. He loves the nature of this valley. He loves the fact that the Brandywine is where the north and the south meet so that you get northern plants and southern plants and all mingling. It's a very interesting area ecologically. N.C. Wyeth has a, has a son, Andy, and he says to Andy, you will never go to school. School is corrupting for an artist. Uh, no great artist ever went to school. Look at Leonardo. Um, so Andy Wyeth gets no education at all, but is trained by his father, and he grows up to become Andrew Wyeth, the painter. Now, there's a generation gap about Andrew Wyeth. I have never met anyone under 40 who's ever heard of Andrew Wyeth. Present company accepted, no doubt. Y'all are very educated as I've learned in the last 24 hours, but uh, most young people have never heard, never heard of Andrew Wyeth, which is shocking to us old folks because in the 60s and 70s, every coffee table in America had a copy of Andrew Wyeth's famous book, Wyeth at Kerner's, his paintings of Kerner Farm. And I think that something has fundamentally changed in my lifetime as regards the arts. Painting has, I think, disappeared from the cultural consciousness of most Americans. Growing up in the 70s in Alabama, um, Andrew Wyeth, everyone had heard of Andrew Wyeth. Everyone had seen Andrew Wyeth paintings. If you turned on the Partridge family on TV, uh, what do they have in the dining room? They have an Andrew Wyeth print on the wall in the dining room. Um, in, in the Peanuts cartoon by Charles Schultz, what does Snoopy really want in his doghouse? He wants an original Andrew Wyeth painting, and he gets it. And there's a whole storyline about Snoopy and Andrew Wyeth. Can you name an artist today that commands that kind of respect, that kind of cultural preeminence? 
And, you know, for centuries, artists were culturally preeminent. You think about the, the great painters uh, Degas and um, Manet in, in 19th century France. These were cultural heroes. And America has these cultural heroes in the arts up until around, and Dana could fill me in here, but up until around 1978 or something, and suddenly they evaporate. And we just don't have in our consciousness today these great painters as role models and inspirations. What I wonder what's happened. Well, it, it is. A, I mean, it's really an interesting uh, issue because I'm reading right now a book that none of you should need or should read. It's a biography of a composer named Bernard Herrmann. Uh, you all know his music because he was the person who wrote the scores for Alfred Hitchcock, for Orson Welles, some of Martin Scorsese's and things like this, best known for the, the music of, in Psycho. You know, and, and he started off in radio. And uh, you know, one of his first jobs, this is why I bought this book about 20 years ago, is it gives us a depiction. There used to be on CBS radio, uh, you know, a weekly show where they would recite famous poems with symphonic backgrounds. There was another one where they would do you know, uh, famous works of literature. Uh, you had popular concerts. Arturo Toscanini was a commercial broadcast artist. I mean, the greatest composer, conductor in the world was given probably at that point the best orchestra in the world, you know, for broadcast. And this was part of commercial entertainment. And it was assumed that you would be doing serious literature, serious drama. And Andrew Wyeth, I knew as a kid because Life Magazine, yep. you know, and Time Magazine would print his photos on the cover of, I think both of them, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so there was a notion that popular culture. When Johnny Carson went on vacation in the, in the uh, late 60s, uh, who uh, took his show, his show over for a week? An opera singer, Beverly Sills. Because there was, the opera singers and musicians were still in popular culture. I saw Art, our, uh, Arthur Rubinstein, Yasha Heifetz, you know, and you know, these great classical musicians on things like the Perry Como show, the Rosemary Clooney show. Um, and so it was part of it, and that all disappeared. And it disappeared, I think, for two reasons. Uh, you know, first of all, ironically, the creation of national uh, public radio and, and uh, public television gave the commercial networks an excuse uh, to opt out of that part of their public service. And th these big prestige shows they used to do, they no longer had to do. Uh, and, you know, ironically, uh, NPR and uh, public uh, you know, television are less and less interested in art. They're mostly interested in politics and things like that nowadays. Secondly, the new schools of art were, uh, so they were fundamentally elitist. They really believed that artists could only talk to other artists. There was a, and I was educated this at Harvard. Harvard, they told me that the future of poetry would be these small intellectual elites that needed training, communicating with each other at the highest level, which you know I thought, you know, t t uh, was horseshit, um, and uh, you know it seemed to me that art that was not if I write a poem that's not available to alert, intelligent, curious people, then the problem is my problem, not theirs, uh, and that doesn't mean that you. Uh, but the thing is, you never talk down to an audience. And, and I think that they, they believe it. So you had, so at that point, you know, commercial radio, you had Orson Welles, you had all these very famous, you know, people that were doing, and they were doing their stuff at their best because that was what uh, commercial inter uh, broadcasting made available at that same. You know, poems used to be in newspapers. Uh, you know, uh, most American writers of the 19th, early 20th century made their reputation in newspapers. Mm -hmm. And that part of public culture is kind of sunk down in its, highly commercial. And I think, you know, right now, I mean, if you look at the state of, of, of commercial entertainment, video games and things like this, it's not something we should feel great about. You know, I think it appeals to what is worst in us rather than what is best on us, in us. And, you know, I think what you, we want, and this is the problem, how do we do this? How do we bring a, create a, a culture which uh, awakens and develops that which is best in us versus, you know, that which is weakest. I, I think people are widely aware of this cultural decline. I, when I taught at Princeton, I got to be in some of these faculty lounges. I mean, talk about the sausage factory. 
be in the faculty lounge and hear what they actually talk about. If they weren't complaining about uh, boys with baseball caps, which is, was a favorite target of, of faculty in the faculty lounge, boys in baseball caps in their classrooms, you got to watch out. And the other topic was cultural decline. Nobody reads anymore. Oh my gosh. Remember when we were kids and everyone read and you turn on the TV, they'd be something educational. I mean, even they are aware of this. It's real. It's real. And people across the spectrum have noticed this general decline. Do you, do you, do you just despair? No, I, I, I agree with you, Ed, but I would say it's met with a passionate passivity on their part. I mean, when I the the better the educational institution, my experience is the more the less that these people are concerned with it. Uh, you know that when you get down to the trenches of a community college, there's always teachers that really are trying to save kids' lives. But to a certain degree, the Ivy Leagues they're above it. Uh, but my my message to you is that if you do the right thing, you do it well, uh, you do it with panache and with quality, it will work. And I'll give you a, 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 an example. I mentioned this earlier, so please, uh, the people that I, we spoke to at lunch, pardon me for repeating myself. It won't be the first or last time I do it. Uh, uh, when I was at the NAA, we wanted to do an arts education program. I felt fundamentally that one of the main roles uh, that, that we had was arts education. Actually, Senator Sessions who was dubious of the institution, and I, and not for, you know, for bad reasons, and the dubious of me, I think what we agreed on was the importance in the sense of, of you know, making it uh, uh, important to education. We didn't have the money to do this. I mean, we'd take billions of dollars to do music, but uh, as a poet, I knew poetry was cheap and portable. And so we, create, we proposed a national poetry recitation competition for high school students. Um, we uh, tested it in, in the District of Columbia, uh, you know, largely in African-American schools, and we tested it in Chicago. And we came to, with a program that seemed to us like a, a very good program. We have, uh, of the 51 states, District of Columbia, uh, you know, being the 51st, 49 of the states refused to do it. Only Pennsylvania and District of Columbia would agree to do it. And their reasons were teenagers don't like poetry. Two, memorization is repressive. Three, it is demeaning to do arts in competition. Take that, Tchaikovsky International Competition. Take that, Dancing with the Stars. Uh, fourth, fourth and final, that to memorize and recite po poetry was uh, was discriminated against African Americans and immigrants. Uh, we, all four reasons I felt were bogus, and uh, I had a, a colleague, a junior colleague, he's now one of the people that runs Substack, who's far more charming than I am, <laughs> and uh, I did the intellectual, you know, uh, artillery, and he did the charm, and we finally got the states to agree that they could do it for one year. And then when it didn't work, uh, they could do you know whatever they wanted to do with the money. Uh, at the end of one year, it was the most successful program that they had in their arsenal. And it is now the signature program of the state's arts organizations. What they discovered was that, you know, teenagers kind of like poetry, that uh, memorization is actually a very powerful educational tool that we had written off. Three, and this is the, one of the most interesting things to me, is when you do an art in competition, it actually becomes more interesting. You know, when we have 10 kids up here reciting poems in competition, the audience is saying, I have my experience of it, but I wonder what her experience is. And, I want, and then you also wonder, why do they choose that poem? The audience is riveted in these, I was surprised because I like poetry, but I didn't think, you know, I wasn't sure of the thing, but is the, 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 the events are very powerful. Plus the students are there, the parents are there, and you create an hour of poetry culture. And fourth, and this is just a matter of historical record, uh, an overwhelming number of the winners, I mean, not just the majority, but I'm saying like about 80% are African-American or first-generation Americans. And 
These are kids that are smart enough to get that command of language is one of the ways you succeed uh, in life, in Amer certainly in, a, in American life. Now, okay, that's not, nice. Joya is bragging about how smart he is, which I do. Uh, <laughs> but here's what I want, it's, it's interesting. Uh, if we, you look at arts participation surveys, we have 40 years of uh, the largest arts survey in the world about Americans. It's so detailed that we can tell, we can break down every, uh, every uh, age group, every income group, every race, both genders, every region, professional, all these things. You know, you can analyze it with statistical reliability with all the subcategories. In the years since this program has be be begun, the American poetry audience has been, become the only art in America that is growing. And among younger people, the people that are in the program, it has doubled in size in the last 10 years. Uh, we saw the same thing during the years we were able to do the Big Read. We were able to take 23 years of decline in literary reading in the United States and reverse them because we were able to do it at a, at a, with the highest quality um, material at a, at a broad thing. So my message is really simple. We can create the culture that we want to live in. But in order to do that, you have to do it well. You have, no one can do it alone. We have to do it together, uh, but it will work. And we, and, and we have just in the pathetic budgets we had at the NEA, we did it by doing it. And then as it began to work, we began to have partnerships. By the time the big read was done, I had 10,000 institutional partners uh, and it made a difference. So, you know, uh, so I, so I'm a, I'm a cultural optimist, but I'm also, it's like everything else in life. It takes, it takes hard work and it takes intelligence. If I may interject, ask a question on the, t on the subject of education. Um, Barksell, you mentioned Leonardo earlier, who was a bastard child and who, uh, didn't go to the, the elite, uh, Latin schools at the time in, um, you know, Florence. Um, and you mentioned that Andrew Wyeth was act he was actually homeschooled, correct? So he didn't go through the standard educational uh, route that perhaps his peers did. Um, so if we're talking about, you know, creating and perhaps these educational programs, Dana, are, uh, we're seeing great success in them. If we're looking for the unicorns today that are going to influence the greater artistic landscape, do we need, a, you know, a, a Medici family to be funding this sort of art? These patrons who like the patrons in, the, in those days um, were great patrons of this art that created you know, that influenced uh, history for centuries to come. Um, are we able to find this sort of art through the educational system? Um, I, I think there was a comment one of you made earlier about how um, that, you know, Dana, you mentioned your own education, right? And um, when you went to college, it seemed like that was, there was this dearth of artistic uh, t talent. Um, so how do we discover the sort of artist, these, these artists that do become influential and do these elite academies produce what we're looking for? This country is so big, is so various, that no one thing will solve the pro all problems. I mean, you just gotta admit that. You just can't, you know, it's like everybody, everywhere I would go in the country and give a speech, they'd say, oh, that's great, we'll just change it. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, the thing is that uh, I'm a, you know, we may, and indeed we have great, this country has such incredible philanthropic uh, you know, history. I mean, look at the National Gallery of Arts. As Roosevelt administration was suing uh, Andrew Mellon uh, me really mendaciously for tax evasion, he gave his fortune and his art collection to the United States. And then it was discovered after his death that he'd overpaid his taxes by six dollars. Uh, you know, but it was, you have these institutions that are, that other countries don't have because individuals have, you know, you know, have done in, in the Brandywine Valley, you know, you, 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 you know, the DuPont family has been um, generous in this regard. So you'll have that. But I'm from poor people and and poor people understand that God helps those who help themselves. That my advice is, it, it you know, is it start with yourself. You know, try to d develop your own intelligence, your own knowledge, your own culture as as your inclinations allow and as you know uh you know your your you know your 
your time and, 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 and life allow. So you start with that and then try to enrich the lives of your family. And then every institution that you're involved in, try to make it better. You know, because uh, it's going to, I think the really powerful things in the United States start from the ground up. You know, and then at some point, you know, the, the top comes down to meet them. But I, you know, but I think in your churches, in your schools, in your community organizations, uh, you should do this. Now, I was surprised at USC that my, that my best read students were homeschooled. Uh, because I had, a, I had a very low estimate of homeschooling. I thought that was just something, you know, nuts did. But, 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 as, as, but as, you know, using agricultural uh, metaphors, by their fruits shall ye know them. And I saw the fruit of really good homeschooling, and it was it made a believer of me. But I, I don't think that most people want a homeschool. I think it's, you know, but if that's your thing, that seems to work. I think that all across America, people are reinventing primary and secondary education because they don't trust public education. Now, if you can reform your public education, do it. But if not, you know, you know educate your, your, your kids in religious or classical or private schools that you know that are giving, giving them an education. Um, we have to, our, when your culture is broken, when the cultural institutions are broken, you can either you know, be broken with them or you invent a counterculture. I think across this country right now, we're seeing the development of a new counterculture. It's traditional, tends to be conservative, it tends to be Christian or Jewish. Uh, and we are creating institutions to educate our own children. And we're doing it at great sacrifice to ourselves. But I don't think that's bad. But I think, you know, we've also got to do that with cultural institutions, uh, with, you know, with the media, et cetera, et cetera. But if everyone in this room could do one good thing, it has a, an immense cumulative importance. And if we did anything together, there's enough people just under this tent that, could, that can change something fundamentally nationally. If we had the right program and you know, uh, you know and uh, we work together, well, I was going to ask you a question. Your your ideas are so um, convincing, and you express them so reasonably and in such um, an eloquent way. But am I right? You've made a lot of enemies along the way, haven't you? By singling out, for example, for example, critics maybe that you think are not doing their job and not or being being too soft and too easy on some fairly bad poetry along the way. I'm the second most hated person in American poetry. <laughs> There's one fellow whom I know who's done more negative reviews than me, and he and I gladly give him the honors, you know. Uh, but I, 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 uh, I was telling you, we were talking earlier, that, you know, I don't see myself as a confrontational cultural person. I don't try to get into arguments. I don't try, you know, as a reviewer, I may have to if I get a bad book or a bad... But what I try to do is to go into a situation and, and say the truth and try to build a consensus around the truth. And it's surprising uh, how often this works. But, you know, you could, I'm able to do it in a, in a small cultural world. I was able to do it in a, on a broad scale for the seven years I was in Washington. But I ch did not want to spend my life in Washington. You know, I thought that was a, there was a different kind of, for an artist, it was, a, it would have meant the death of me as an artist. But does it take a, do you have a thick skin so that when you are attacked, I mean, I think you've, you've probably been attacked from many different angles. Have you probably been called elitist? I've been called everything. Every, you can't believe what I've been called. <laughs> Some of it's probably true. I don't know. Uh, but I'll give you an example. Uh, I had a mother who never gave me a compliment. Uh, you know, when she was dying, you know, we, we, fly back, my brothers and I would fly across countries and we would be with her for you know, a week. So I remember coming in from, I, I was in the Senate, I had to leave right to the airport from the Senate, flew across the country in you know, my Washington suit, I got to the hospital, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, traveling for about nine hours. I come into my mother, you know, I, I told my brother I'd pick her up at chemo and she's lying there in chemo. I see my mother, my heart's breaking. Um, I look at her and I say, oh, my poor mother. And I come up and she, I see her eyes flicker open and she looks at me and she goes, you got fat. <laughs> uh, and so uh, on my first Washington hearing uh, in the House, this is when shortly after the House had voted to eliminate the National Endowment for the Arts, I talked to every member privately. We you know, had long conversations. We had very positive, you know, uh, get in the, in the, to the 
hearing room, there's cameras and everything else. First thing the chairman says is, you know, Chairman Joya, would the United States not be uh, better served if we shut down the National Endowment for the Arts tomorrow and gave the money to the Department of Education? Well, that I think because of the last two, you know, three words is a, is a fallacious argument. Uh, but, you know, but it's, it sounds good. And, and, and everybody just attacked me for two you know, for, uh, hours. In fact, they canceled the next hearing so they could continue to attack me. Uh, but, it, you know, they would say this, and I would find the one thing I could agree with, and I'd take that, I'd agree with them, uh, and then I would sort of say what I thought was, was right, and we'd go to the next person. And at the end of it, you know, my staff is just sweating, and, they're, you know, they're going, because they gave me 172 questions that, and I told them, and I told them, this is for prep. And I said, they're not going to ask me any of these. They said, oh, no, no, those are the questions. Not one of those questions were asked, and they're sweating. So at the end of it, I'm leaving, and the chair, and the, the committee chair says, he says, have you done this before? I said, no, this is my first one. He says, you were great. So you never, you never made anybody look bad. You know, you, even when you disagreed, you agreed with them first, and then you did said what you wanted to say, and everybody was able to, because I realized, you know, you know, Senator Sessions knows this, everybody's talking to the camera. They're not talking to me. They're not talking, they're talking to their constituency through the camera. And, you know, and so it's not really about the thing. And, and he says, it was a great, you never got mad. You never got cool. And I, without thinking, I said, it's just like talking to my mother. Uh, uh, so I said, so the answer is yes, I have a thick skin. And I was raised that way. Uh, but I, you know, arguments, I think arguments, this is why you have to have free speech in universities. Well, you got to have people that say things you disagree with, and they have to say things that you disagree with. Because out of those disagreements, you know, I think, you know, comes clarification. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that that uh, free speech is not simply under peril, but it's it's uh, it, it's not functioning in, in, in uh, most universities, to me, is an enormous intellectual crime. Yeah. I will. I want to quickly pivot to the topic of beauty before we we get to Q and A, um, especially because a lot of you heard Dana speak earlier on beauty, and I uh, definitely want to hear about the dispute between Andrew Wyeth and NC Wyeth about what constituted uh, art in the first place and and beauty, because NC seemed to have this you know he, he had an old fashioned idea about it as you explained to me, and uh, Andrew was interested in more of a of a primitive beauty. Um, and if you look at his heart, which, art, which I encourage you to, on, you know, on your phones, um, either now or after this talk, um, you'll see it was not necessarily, you know, colorful. It was much more uh, raw. So this created a schism. And I'm interested in hearing about how, you know, these two men, these who are, you know, related to each other, um, one trained the other, came to differently understand what was art and what was beautiful. And Dana, if you could talk about um, you know, some of your remarks earlier between c how conceptual art doesn't quite capture that. Um... Well, actually, I have something to, when, when you know, I have, I have some, two little tidbits to offer about Wyeth. Do you, I want to hear your tidbits first. As a poet, I would say the argument between father and son was a poetic argument. Uh, N.C. Wyeth, his, his mode was narrative, and Andrew Wyeth's mode was lyric. And so they, they were talking at artistic cross purposes. They were in some ways the preeminent artists of those modes, mm -hmm. but you know, the son didn't follow in the, in the father's mode. But I wanted to tell you that when I first came, one of the, the jobs of the, Nation, of the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts is to chair the National Medal of Arts mm -hmm. uh, Committee. And every year we have all these nominations that come in, uh, you know, the, when we provide a list to the president. And um, the first year I was there, it was, I thought it was a very unimpressive list. It was um, a previous administration had, had kind of a pop culture orientation, and the administration where I worked initially had kind of a pop culture. But I didn't think we needed another Grammys or, an, or Academy Awards. And so I began saying that we had to be more serious, and, uh, and I was able to actually make a convincing argument, but that's a whole other story. Uh, but I said, you know, I, I had my own list, and there's, on that list was Andrew Wyeth. Uh, but when I would bring Andrew Wyeth's name up, they, everybody admitted they liked him, but they didn't think he was respectable. Uh, that, you know, because the, the artistic establishment, they hated Wyeth because he was the most popular artist in the United States, yeah. you know, and he was a realist. Yeah. And they could never forgive him for the, the combination of those two things. And, and, and year after year, and so finally, uh, there was a painter, Makado Fujimoto, you, you might, might know him, was on there. And I got him. I said, what did you think? And we talked about it. He said, well, you know, I really like Wyeth's technique. I like his brush stroke. He's an abstract, this guy was an abstract artist. 
So I said, I said, Marco, you know, the two of so we together did it. And then we got Terry Teach out, who was uh, this, you know, you know, critic was on. We got, I got him. I nominated him on the board. I got him, and we finally got Wyeth through. Okay. And when we got Wyeth through, our the coverage for the awards went from about here to about there right. because there was a kind of a rejoicing I felt. Now you could say that high culture hated him, but middle brow culture. You know, like them. I think the average reporter, the uh, you know journalist, the average they they liked you know why that he was a tremendous success. The Bushes then invited him upstairs, where he began jumping up and down on the bed of the in the Lincoln bedroom, which I I actually witnessed. <laughs> you know, it was but he 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 was happy. He was he had wanted this award his whole life. Yeah, and I think that he felt that he would been and it was it was wonderful. He'd given um, a um, a painting to the White House, and he was delighted to see that it was, and because you know, the, the Bushes loved it, and it was nice to to feel like you one had righted, you know, in a national sense, a small historical wrong, but in a personal sense, a very great uh, wrong. Yeah, that's it, I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, Wyeth well, had an interesting relationship with presidents. Um, Dwight Eisenhower loved the paintings of Andrew Wyeth. I have a theory about this. I think part of why Wyeth was so popular in the fifties is that he showed these agricultural landscapes that people had grown up with. People had grown up on farms. Of course, Eisenhower had grown up on a farm. All, you know, all generation had grown up on farms. And then all those farms vanish in the 50s. And so that nostalgia in Wyeth, I think, deeply appealed to people of a certain age in the mid 20th century. But uh, Dwight Eisenhower wanted to learn how to paint, but he was embarrassed to be known to be painting because he thought that would be sort of unrepublican to be painting. So, but he secretly got uh, Andrew Wyeth to visit him at the White House and give him art lessons. And then um, Kennedy invited um, Andrew Wyeth down to his inaugural, but Wyeth was so mad that Nixon had lost that he refused to come to Kennedy's inaugural. Um, then Nixon had him to the White House in a great, splendid celebration, and Nixon gushed and gushed about Andrew Wyeth, but that may have tainted Andrew Wyeth going forward. He wasn't invited back to the White House until, well, that's until what, you invited him. One of the interesting things is that Nixon was a secret esthete. See, Republicans feel they, if they like art, they have to hide it. You know, and, uh, you know, because it's, it's not going to earn him any votes. Exactly. I have a small anecdote about Wyeth. I met the man who flew Andrew Wyeth to Washington that day. And Wyeth insisted on stopping at the local grocery store, which is across the street here. And he, he got this soggy uh, sandwich and a plastic wrapper and a, and a bottle of Yoo-Hoo chocolate milk. And he took these with him in the, on the plane and in the limo to the White House. And it got to the end of the ceremony and, and President Bush said, uh, we have a beautiful lunch for you in the East Room. And Wyeth said, no, I, I brought my lunch. <laughs> and he got in the limo and he left. And he went back to... Well, no, no, he went upstairs first. They said, well, they, they, they said, he said, they asked, he asked, do you have that painting of, of yeah. that I gave you? They said, yeah. So they took him up. And so then I, I was summoned from the thing. He was, you know, they so the first lady says, you have to see what Andrew Wyeth is doing. <laughs> and so I went up and I, and I saw it. But, you know, the, it's good that we're mentioning because look at the stone that the house around us is built with. Uh, the arts uh, have traditionally... Come, are built by people in a particular place out of the materials of a particular place, celebrating the existence in a personal place. And I think one of the great tragedies of American culture right now, people feel you have to go to New York or maybe Los Angeles to be an artist, you know, where, uh, you know, look at Italy, every small town, you know, produced its master. And I think that, you know, that we, that we've lost that. I mean, you know, I, I think that we should be building out of local materials. I mean, I think a house, uh, you know, where I live in Sonoma County, surrounded by redwoods, should have different materials than where there's great field stone and things like that. And that's that's the beauty of I think uh, uh, Delaware and Pennsylvania. The domestic architecture I think is is truly wonderful because it reflects the landscape out of which it came. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, there's a sense of place here, and you've written about senses of place, and there's a very very strong one here in the uh, in the Brandywine Valley. Yeah, and uh, you know it's the same with it, when I think a lot of us feel somewhat. Uh, skeptical about world culture, about our decisions being made elsewhere by, you know, by people who know what's best for us, you know, and, um, and I just see buildings all the time that are so bad that you had to go to graduate school to, to be, uh, to, to make a, a building that ugly. Uh, you know, where I go to these small, you know, when I was Port Warrior of California, 
I set my goal was to, to visit all 58 counties of California. Now that sounds odd, but Cal most of these things are tiny towns. They were made counties in the, in, during the gold rush and they only have a thousand people or 1400 people. But you go there and the houses were all built by local carpenters. They're beautiful, they're full of invention, uh, and the people in them love them so much they preserve them, you know, for you know, now coming on close to two centuries. You know, where you go into the big cities and the and the buildings are impersonal. They're yeah. you know, they uh, they're slightly uh, uh, dehumanized. And 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 so I think that it's just to 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 regain uh, to celebrate what it is like to exist where we live. Yeah. seems to me a high goal of culture. That's one thing the South has had. I mean, the Southern literature, uh, you know, was perhaps defiantly regional, but it, in some ways it was a lot of the greatest literature of the 20th century comes out of the South, which was poor, uh, badly educated, you know, versus the rest of the country, but had a real sense of its own identity and destiny. Chairman, mm. we are running out of time, and I'd like to leave some uh, opportunity for Q&A. Um, and after that, Dana, would you actually be able to read or uh, recite to us the poem? I'll recite a poem. Oh, excellent. Well, thank you, gentlemen, so much. We'll take some questions. Um, let's do... Oh, yeah. Mike's... Oh, you guys can actually go back to the mic back there. So uh, front row, Armand. Do mine? Okay. I was going to ask you to recite a poem, so I'm really looking forward to that after. But my my other question was... Could you give your perspective, Dana, on the relationship between formal and regular metric rules of poetry um, and that accessibility, the popularity versus the elite character of... Yeah, let me do, I can do this actually quite briefly. The important thing to remember about poetry is that poetry was an art that was not merely invented, but it was perfected before the invention of writing. It comes out of oral culture. And so it's a... As Robert Frost said, it's a way of remembering what it would impoverish us to forget. So all poetry, it's once again one of the many human universals that postmodernist academics deny. Uh, every, every country, every language, every group has poetry, and it uh, is organization of sounds that native speakers can hear. Now, there's certain sounds that exist in some languages which don't ex exist in ours. Chinese, they arrange uh, syllables and tones. But in English, uh, you know, we tend to have a stress, you know, language. To be or not to be, that is the question. And so we hear stresses. And so uh, all poetry was formal through almost all of its history really until uh, the 19th century, and really, for the most part, not until the very end of the 19th century. It was the first generation of writers who grew up on a typewriter who began to do free verse. And, I, and they started thinking of language as something that was on a page. And it, it's a powerful technique, but uh, I think it's always a secondary technique. For most people, they uh, listen to poetry as a spoken performance. And to, to do this, you have to organize sound. Meter is the most, um, uh, the most common and I think the most popular way of organizing sound. And it makes the language not simply mnemonic, not something you remember, but it intensifies the language. And I'll, I'll give you one statistic. If I just record you guys talking and I say, how many syllables have you said? How many of those syllables are stressed versus unstressed? you'll get about a three to one ratio. You go into poetry, and what do we know from I iambic pentameter? It's a one to one ratio. So for every two syllables, one of those, you know, one's stressed, one's unstressed. So you see, stress is how we say meaning uh, in English. So it's a way of intensifying meaning, making it more mnemonic. If you need a demonstration, uh, let's say for the moment of fiction that Marlo and I are gonna get married. And it comes that moment in the ceremony where I affirm my consent. And I say, it, what's the two syllables that I'm going to say? I do. Now, let me say them with four different stress patterns. And you tell me which person you want to marry. I know you would. Uh, I do. No stresses. You say yes? No. Ooh. Okay. 
I do? No. I do? No, you want two stresses. I do. And it's the same syllables, but the stress changes the meaning. That's the nature of our language. That's the power um, of meter. Yes. Thank you, Dr. or Mr. Joya, for your talk. Joya. Joya, yes. Thank you for your talk. It was really wonderful. You mentioned in the honors luncheon about um, beauty and how it's a personal experience. It's something that like each person can experience individually. I mean, not say you can't. Everyone experiences beauty like through themselves. Um, and today, you also mentioned in the talk to, on the panel today how <clears throat> like a lot of culture has festered and like grown through like smaller communities and in these like home the towns. You're mentioning the carpenters and they build up these houses. Um, due to like social media and having the such like a big wide stage where so many people are viewing whatever through their smartphones or computers or whatever else is there is there really a way to do you think it's possible to get like a uh, art to be seen or like like have like trans transformative culture through such a large thing or can it only be seen like can it only be restricted to a certain area or a certain thing within a community well let me ask with is there anybody in around us except for the, perhaps the babies who have not traveled at least a thousand miles to be in the presence of something beautiful. Every one of you has again and again. In fact, you know, uh, you're probably complaining that you don't do it enough, right? People are drawn to beauty. Oscar Wilde said, man is hungry for beauty. There is a void. The first uh, issue is to create, to find that which is beautiful. And if you communicate it at some level, it will draw people to them. I mean, this is the, you know, I think the 12 tone music, if you know what that is. For a hundred years, 12 tone music has been practiced in the university. Everybody's been taught it. It's been told it's the music of the future. End of a century, nobody likes it. Uh, you know, and it's, uh, you know, professors of music will argue, oh no, uh, Bert, you know, Schoenberg's Moses and Aaron is, popular favorite of mine, uh, you know, but you go, you know, it's never on their turntable, um, you know, but, but, but so the thing is that you, like so many conservatives have given up hope on your culture. You know, you ought to listen to Reverend Ike, you know, when he was on the radio, you can't lose with the stuff I use. And it's true. If Beauty is subjective in your own experience, but you are reacting to something that has an objective reality. Uh, uh, the beauty of the world, the beauty of creation is powerful. Artists repre and represent that. What we need to do is to know and uh, promote and to share that which is the best. Uh, and, and I think, I mean, I think if you build it, they will come. If you offer it, they will come. I had the hardest humanities class at USC. I worked my students to such a degree. I flunked half of them at the midterm. They never, they never had worked so hard in any social science or humanities class in their life. And I had to turn away. I had to stop enrollment at 205. Jeez. Uh, and it's because people said, you know, because they were experiencing beauty in the class. I was trans. I wasn't transforming them, the poetry was. I was putting them in a way that they, they had to internalize it and it was transformative and people wanted to be there. So we have to have confidence. Uh, and, and you can't let, say, well, somebody else is gonna do it for me. You know, uh, you know, all over the country, there are people that are starting these things. You know, if, you, know you need to join uh, you know, ranks with them, you need to, to support them. And we can do it. But it, you know, it it will take effort. Thank you so much. It, it'll take twenty years. I, I feel like you have a very eclectic taste, and I I admire that. And I would say to to all of you who are young and you want to know more about art, open your mind to all areas of art, as I think you do to poetry. You are not dogmatic that you know modernism is bad. I hear that so much in the area of the art of, of painting. Is I don't like modern art. I don't like modern art. I taught uh, 20th century art last fall. It was a great student. She sat right in the front row. She was with me with Picasso. She was with me with Matisse. <laughs> so half with me with Paul Clay. 
And then we get into like Malevich's black square and she's sinking lower and lower in her chair. And finally we're at, I think, Mondrian and she just literally just dropped her notebook on the floor and rolled her eyes back like, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Don't be, don't be that student, you know, smart, but bigoted, frankly, against 20th and 20th century. Yeah, but I think you should open yourself up and you like what you like and you yeah. don't like what you don't like. And you should try to constantly expand your taste. But to another Oscar Wilde quote, only an auctioneer um, approves of all schools of art. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, so, but, but I think if you do, you have to expose yourself and you'll be surprised at what you like. Uh, and I think there's a default position among conservatives, you know, that they, they, you know, they really only want a kind of old, traditional, sentimental, old stuff, you know, and okay, but, you know, that's, you're not going to lead a cultural uh, renewal, you know, with, with, with that as your arsenal. I think that's exactly, exactly right. And right. Don't score, don't score in Picasso. Soak it in. Give, give yourself up to it. And if after six months you really don't like it, fine, move on. But don't be ignorant. Uh, that's the key thing. Don't be ignorant. I think we have time for one more. Or are we? OK, one more question, please. I'd be very curious to know what you think can be done to cultivate a love for reading and literature in students, especially in K through 12 students. Throughout the panel, I couldn't help but think of a memory from high school where I saw a student with Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, and I asked him what he thought of it. And instead of talking about the actual content of the book, he re immediately went to the fact of, of how long it was and of the fact of that it had a very small text because they, had to, they wanted to cram into a single book rather than into yeah. multiple volumes. And so you have this work, this brilliant work of literature that's full of meaning and philosophical insight. And instead of talking about any of that, they're just talking about how annoying the assignment was based on the way that it was being taught and presented to them. What do you think could be done to avoid things like well, that? Well, you know, um, we did, it was ironic, but the NEA actually was the only organization in the U.S. government which looked at everything that American public money had been used to research reading, the effects of reading. the, uh, And we put together 47 different reports done by everything from the Bureau of Prisons to the Department of Education. And you'd think different methodologies, different names, they would disagree. They don't. There there were about uh, a dozen lessons. And I, and I uh, uh, Senator Sessions, this was not about you. I said, I wanted to be put we had a big report. I said, I want a small report so simple a senator can understand it. Uh, you know, because you got, you got busy guys. You got busy guys, and you're not, you know, if you don't get it to them right away, you know, you lost them. Because there's already got five phone calls, you know, going on in your conversation. But what we discovered was this, that uh, two things that are related. One is that reading is like playing the violin. It's a cumulative skill. It is not a natural ability that people have, and you've got to begin it early, and the more they practice, the easier it gets, and the more mastery they have. Uh, we have a system right now, or a society right now, where they say, well, kids will learn in reading in school, and we're not going to reinforce it anywhere else. Consequently, they don't really develop much mastery. That's where, the, where I realized with the homeschool kids, that they had parents that were made them read. The second thing is that and uh, reading has a strange transformative effect on people uh, who do it well and do it habitually. Uh, it tends to increase their own, uh, the, the depth and intensity of their inner life, which means, most importantly, two things. They begin to look at their own life as a story and begin to work harder, in a sense, to realize their own destiny. And secondly, especially literary readers, they begin to realize that other people have an inner life as complicated and as rich as their own. It builds a kind of empathy. Now, why would, and this is true, people who read better exercise more. People who read more go to sports more. They play sports more. They vote more. They have higher educational success. They have higher uh, economic success. Uh, they have higher personal success. If you go to the losers, of go into a prison, uh, most prisons have a, a uh, full literacy rate of about 
between three seven percent. Ten percent of the U.S. population is is fundamental of adult population is illiterate at this point. Uh, not much different than it was in 1890 or 1900 with these great waves of immigrants. So we look on this thing, and we realize that reading is something you have to develop early. You have to practice constantly. And the rewards of it are not merely your ability to experience these great minds like Dostoevsky or Tolstoy, uh, but it has, it will change the outcome of an individual's life for the better. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to, everybody's going to end up as St. Francis of Assisi, uh, but it, it, it changes the likelihood of positive outcomes in at least a dozen statistically measurable ways that don't make any logical sense otherwise. I mean, you think readers are sitting on their butt reading a book. Why are they exercising more? And it's because they take their own lives more seriously and understand the power of narrative. So I think that what it is is that we, uh, we assign bad books, especially for boys in education right now, so we lose the boys almost immediately. And now we're, you know, leading the girls in, uh, there was a, a, a deeply flawed article that was in the New Yorker about two months ago about the death of the English major. But the thing that was really scary is that Harvard undergraduates have a problem reading Nathaniel Hawthorne, and as the, as the teacher said, at a sentence level. Yeah. My students, I made them learn what every word meant in every poem, and I tested them on it. I made them memorize poems from the very first class and I made them recite them in front of two other uh, hundred students. That took an immense amount of my time. But if, you, if the teachers invest the time, if the teachers set the standards, if the teachers are exemplifying, I memorized every text I taught, it will, it will work. But you know, I'm sure that that teacher at Harvard is not teaching her students to read at a sentence level because it's beneath her dignity. I'm, I'm po I was raised poor. Nothing's beneath my dignity. <laughs> you know, if it has to get done and somebody's got to do it, most likely it's going to be you. Uh, and so anyway, uh, I think you're right. But I think the thing is that we have to look on this thing is there's not a one-time intervention that's going to change this. It's, in a sense, the creation of good habits in the same way that we do for health, we do for fitness. So you want me to end with a poem? Yeah, that'd be uh, great. This is a poem. I'll do this poem because... Uh, somebody mentioned it to me that it was their favorite poem of mine. And it's a very simple poem, and it actually takes place in a space like this. It takes place at a wedding. And it's a ballad, which is, I think, the most popular uh, form of spoken poetry. It's called Summer Storm. Let me see if I can remember it now. We stood on the rented patio while the party went on inside. You knew the groom from college. I was a friend of the bride. We hugged the brownstone wall behind us to keep our dress clothes dry and watched the sudden summer storm floodlit against the sky. The rain was like a waterfall of brilliant beaded light, cool and silent as the stars the storm hid from the night. To my surprise, you took my arm, a gesture you didn't explain, and we spoke in whispers, as, uh, as if to imitate the rain. Then suddenly the, uh, the storm receded as swiftly as it came. The doors behind us opened up. The hostess called your name. I watched you merge into the crowd, aloof and yet polite. We didn't speak another word, except to say good night. Why? Does that evening's memory return with this night's storm, a party 20 years ago? Its disappointments warm. There are so many might-have-beens, what-ifs that won't stay buried, other cities, other jobs, strangers we might have mem married, and memory insists on pining, for places we never went, as if life might be happier just by being different. Thank you so much.